Okay, thank you very much. I don't know why I was invited to this meeting, because I'm going to see all kinds of horrible things about fine-tuning. Um, it's a bit strange, I have to say, all this stuff about, um, yeah. I mean, essentially, I was very surprised about two years ago, I was invited to go to um, one of these interdisciplinary meetings in which you bring together people from all over, all over the areas. And I was asked to actually talk about the cosmological constant problem um, with Tamara Davies. We organized a meeting in which, quite unsurprisingly, we got the whole room filled with computer scientists. And, and they were kind of a cross between um, latter-day hippies and geeks, completely loaded with money. Uh, this was Silicon Valley. And, and essentially what these people have been doing for the past, their past lives was to write code for computer games. And I don't know if you've come across these people. They're actually very intelligent. Their brains are fried on LSD, clearly. But, but they are very intelligent, and for them, the universe is a computer game, <laughs> presumably written by someone with a very sick sense of humor, undoubtedly. <laughs> but if they can produce these computer games which are so realistic, why shouldn't our universe be, you know, basically a computer game? Now, what is funny is that if you throw the cosmological constant problem at them, what they say is that it's a bug in the program. <laughs> and in a way, it makes some sense that effectively, um, so they have, there's a whole history of bugs in the program in computer games which occurred because the coder didn't think that the user would be curious enough to go to a given place. <laughs> and this might have been the case with us, okay, in this particular case. So I like this particular idea, and this kind of sets the, the tone for my talk. Essentially, what you're doing is they're building an aptitude into God. <laughs> and, um, and I think a lot of the fine-tuning problems seen from this perspective are going to be a bit like that, I think. So I hope no one takes offense. I'm going to be using God as a metaphor. I don't take this too seriously. I will be using this a few more times. But I think effectively, a lot of these problems are really fake problems. They're problems which we made up because we believe God is inept and effectively we're just blaming someone probably has no blame whatsoever for this. It's just in our heads. So quite often the problem is actually self-inflicted. A lot of the fine-tuning problems are self-inflicted problems. So, for example, you know, if you say things about some instabilities, it's an instability in your theory. It doesn't need to be an instability with the observations. There's some kind of assumption about the dynamics to say that these things are unstable. And an example, which I'm not going to be following through very much, but for example, is this whole thing, why do the constants of nature take the value they take? Well, my, my best answer is the Iraqs, which is, okay, they're not constant. Who told you, who asked you? Who told you that to call them constant? And this is essentially the content of Dirac's seminal paper written during his honeymoon, I'm not sure you know this, which was in Brighton, very poor choice, I would imagine, but anyway, <laughs> it's my point of view. So he decided to write about this as a reaction against something which was very popular at the time, which was numerology. And I believe Heisenberg was the first to ask this question, why is alpha 1 over 137? We know why pi is what it is, we know why 2 is what it is, you know, so... You just start combining numbers, and you come up with these coincidences. Of course, then the, the data gets better. This is what Eisenberg did. And at which point, people just get fed up with this and say, well, why is it really a constant? And this does change the perspective a lot. And in particular, this issue about multiverses and all these various things. Why is the luminosity in this room what it is? Because someone switched on the light. There's nothing special about that. And why are we here now? Because someone switched on the light, we didn't come into a dark room in the first place. So there's kind of things which you try to assign fundamental value to them, and they really don't have any fundamental value. Because if you see things from a different perspective, well, it's a different story altogether. Other problems are even worse, because I think not only are, are they self-inflicted, but they're actually ill-defined. So quite a lot of the things that were said are very sensitive to the measure the problem of the measure, and you don't know if the measure is uniform in a given variable, in the logarithm of the variable, in whatever it is. So there's an assumption about the measure and what is natural or not natural depends on this measure. So we're all suffering from the results of a given election, obviously. I don't know if you know what this is. This is the gerrymander. I don't know if you've heard about gerrymandering. He was apparently a governor of Massachusetts, I believe, um, called Jerry. 
he decided to organize the counties looking like a salamander like this to get the right result in his election, okay? So this is the kind of, so gerrymandering is a portmanteau of the two, and it's an, exp I didn't actually know about this until I was investigating this, but this is the kind of tuning with measure that actually can get you to do any result, and get to any result. And you can create a problem, get rid of a problem, do whatever, by playing with the measure. And the moral of the story in all of this, and I'll give you more concrete examples, but I think something we can take from this is that we do play God with our prejudices, we basically create problems for God to solve with his prejudices, which could be theory, could be measure, could be anything. And, well, maybe she doesn't care. Uh, by the way, the she doesn't care is to do about the prejudice about God, and I actually find this really interesting. Islam doesn't have any representations of God, at least that's democratic. Uh, ours tend to be this one, the, uh, an old man with a beard, and this is prejudice. I love this one, okay? So, obviously, if men was made in the image of God. The first human we know is a woman from Africa, so God must be a black woman, right? Reversing the thing. And I think there's a lot of prejudice about fine tuning, which in a way reflects this kind of prejudice, and we play with it and we create problems which really are not there. Okay, so this is my point of view on this. I'm gonna concretely go into other problems, very concrete. I'm a cosmologist, I'm gonna try and address a bunch of problems with cosmology. Sometimes there's no doubt that the problems can be useful. So I'm not saying that these fine-tuning issues are completely useless. They can motivate interesting science, okay? And historically, the cosmological problems are an example of this. So I'm gonna divide the problems like with diabetes into type one and type two. They're also mark one and mark two historically. So as you know, the flatness problem, the cosmological constant problem, the homogeneity problem, a bunch of things have led to really interesting new physics like inflation. Lots of things were proposed to try to address these issues, which maybe are not that important, but if they left, if they actually led to interesting science, great, okay? So <coughs> what I'm gonna argue is that actually, these type one problems are really not real problems. And um, so for example, why is the universe flat? We know that flatness is unstable. So why not just set k to zero? So I think there would be a quasi-flatness problem if the universe was not exactly flat. But if the universe is exactly flat, there's nothing to discuss. So I'm glad that someone came up with the idea of inflation trying to solve the flatness problem, but I don't think it's a problem in the first place. It's at best inspirational. And anyway, I don't think it is a real problem. Lambda, well, lambda could be the same thing, right? except we have a quasi-lambda problem. Do we? Maybe we don't have a quasi-lambda problem. Maybe lambda is zero, and the acceleration we see is due to a tracking field or some field which is not actually a cosmological constant problem. So the previous talk was a counterexample of this statement. I think actually those problems you mentioned, which were quite spectacular, could be a problem with quantum field theory, not a problem with cosmology. Okay, you're shaking your head. Of course, you would shake your head, <laughs> but I think, I think to my mind, the problem is renormalization. We don't know anything about renormalization. We don't know anything about quantum field theory, and then we're blaming cosmology for that. So I'll be quite happy to just set lambda to zero and then use a tracking field. One thing I did like in your talk is that you did try to falsify the, the, the multiverse, and I think that was interesting. But maybe the problem is not there in the first place either. So there is a third kind of problem, which will lead to what I call the type two problems, or mark two problems, which I hope will be the problems of this generation, not the previous generation, which is basically homogeneity. You can try and play this game, except we have a quasi-homogeneity problem, right? In which I cannot say it's a tracking field. So if the universe was exactly homogeneous, just like if the universe was exactly flat, there wouldn't be a problem. The problem is that, of course, we see this. And you can't just put a tracking field there. This is different, right? This is, you have to explain these things, these structures. Which leads me to the second kind of problems, which is the very specific fluctuations. They have 10 to the minus five amplitude, and they have a spectral index, giving it a red uh, shade, so it's a red spectrum. But it's very specific, it's 0.9667. Why? So I think this is a real fine tuning problem. And if you talk to the people of the previous generation, which came up with inflation, my example is my good friend Andy Albrecht, he just said, well, what's the size of this table? What's the height of this table? You need to explain the height of this table. 
They actually said what's the size of that mound or whatever. And I think this is really unsatisfactory. I really think that the people who came up with solutions to these first problems, really, you know, they were quite metaphysical issues. I'm glad it led to something new, like the inflationary paradigm, but they really not quite serious problems. This is, these are the real problems. I mean, this is really fine tuning. Why is it this shade of red? Why is it on minus five? This is really puzzling. And, you know, it's very easy to dismiss them in this way. But it's actually not, you know, not the correct thing to do. So I think it's important to impart on you that there is a big difference between, so this is the definition of the power spectrum, in case you haven't seen it before. You have your two parameters, A and N S. So the zero order holy grail when I started doing stuff on this area was to get something nearly scale invariant, 10 to the minus five. So 10 to the minus five, to my mind, is always going to be some kind of hierarchy. Clearly there is some hierarchy somewhere and we don't really understand it. Maybe it informs quantum gravity, we don't know. But there is clearly some kind of two scales, the Planck scale and something else, okay? And this is 10 to the minus five. If the spectrum was exactly scale invariant, you'd be very happy. It isn't, it's red. So this is the problem. We've gone to a stage in which we really have more and more information about the spectral index. Now there's a whole issue about tensor modes. So it's not all about scalar modes, there's tensor modes. How much do we have in tensor modes? How much did the universe predict, produce initially in tensor modes? Well, this is really where I think the issue of fine tuning becomes married to another issue, which I think is more important, which is the issue of falsifiability, okay? So this is a plot which I'm sure you have seen. Does this work? It does work. It does work. So this is a plot which shows exactly these two parameters I introduced. So one is the amount of gravity waves, and the other one is the spectral index. So one will be scale invariant. These are the very red, the different red spectrum we have, different shades of red if you want. It's a very nice way to put it. And you probably remember the few years ago, or a couple of we a few months, about a year and a half ago, the bicep result of the detection around here, <coughs> which was paraded as evidence for inflation. Well, in fact, it was the galaxy, it was contamination. So in fact, we're here now. Well, this is evidence for inflation. Well, it could be there, it would be evidence for inflation, it could be there, it could be there. Anything would be evidence for inflation. So we pick up any model, do a go around this, we're talking about the paradigm, I'm not talking about specific potentials like here which do predict these things. I've never seen anyone actually predict concretely some kind of distribution on this plot for the inflationary paradigm. So we heard a talk this morning, which was very interesting, about quantum cosmology possibly being used to limit the number of foldings. This would basically predict on these lines to be closest to this endpoint. So it's the first time actually I see someone trying to actually constrain the distribution function of NS and R in inflation. Okay, and I thought it was, that was interesting, but in general what happens is, throw anything at inflation, inflation predicts it. At which point you might say, well, what is evidence? Why is there so much evidence for inflation? Part of the problem is that we use a tool called the Bayesian evidence, which is really designed for the guys in the city who they have hedge funds and play the lottery. It's not designed for scientists. And of course, you should hedge your bets. If you're playing the lottery or if you're playing the stock market, hedge your bets because that's the way you win. We're not trying to win, we're trying to find a scientific theory. Okay, the reason about this guy, Bayesian evidence is really bad because it basically gives you power law fine for spreading your bets, for not being predictive, and gives an exponential fine if you miss the, the date. <coughs> so you should spread your bets, because one is power law, the other one is exponential. To my mind, this is wrong, because it, you know, basically any kind of science should be about falsifiability. So a theory should not only have a large evidence, but the evidence should be exceptional, given what it would have been had the data been different. And I think this is a definition of pred predictivity and falsifiability. Okay, so I will finish, I will finish, well, this is kind of half the talk. I will finish with the other half of the talk, which is going to be a completely shameless and ashamed <coughs> ad for one and another way to do things, which I will claim is more predictive. So this is, I'm gonna be a salesman now, about something we did recently, and even if you're not interested in this concrete model, at least it shows a very different way to do cosmology which predicts this, okay? Inflation can do any NS, we predict R equals zero, NS equals this. And now you can actually see the number of figures, it could actually have improved this calculation, there are a few uncertainties, others could be circumvented. 
Okay, let me tell you a bit about how to do cosmology in a way which is not inflation. And clearly the bogeyman for solving the homogeneity problem is this guy, is the horizon problem. And this is the cartoon everyone shows, okay? The cartoon is actually taken out of the new scientist. There's a kind of thing, we are here, the, the sky is a cone in four dimensions. Of course the sky was smaller in the past because there was less past before the Big Bang. So you end up with this division of the sky into regions which are disconnected. And this is called the horizon problem, very beautiful. Effectively, if you project this in the sky, it means that regions about, which are far, more far apart than about the size of the moon, are disconnected. So the size of the moon is really small on this picture. So we have this issue. How can I explain the fluctuations in the universe? How can I explain my quasi-homogeneity problem? Well, I need to somehow break the causal structure of the Big Bang universe. Okay, and the way to do it is, for example, the inflation. So this is the cartoon, and maybe a bit more mathematical. How do you compute fluctuations? This is my quantity, my curvature fluctuation. You introduce the Z variable, this is the expansion factor, this is the speed of sound, or speed of light if, it has, if it's not one all the time. So you go through the whole calculation of perturbation in a Friedman model, assuming whatever theory could be Einstein gravity or whatever. This so is the kind of thing you do in your PhD for six months and you get traumatized for the rest of your life. It's an horrendous calculation. You have to do it. The final result is really simple, though. So the final result is just this harmonic oscillator equation with two terms. The first one, if you ignore the second one, this is just pure oscillations. So this is effectively what you have. You have acoustic oscillations due to pressure. You say you have microphysics. You say you have modes inside the horizon. So this reflects causal contact if this guy wins. The other guy wins, there's the wrong sign, it's an instability. So it's like a tachyonic instability. This is gravity. So if something is an overdensity, it will attract more things, the density grows. If something is an underdensity, the stuff around it will attract it, it will be depleted even further. So this is the gene's instability in action. And cosmology is basically cookery between these two. You want to get the timing right between these two things. So ideally, what you'd like to do is for things to start inside the horizon in these oscillations, and then microphysics, well, things are never exactly homogeneous if they're in contact. Could be thermal fluctuations, could be vacuum fluctuations. But basically, the idea is to start here and then be pushed there. So if I want to flesh out the horizon problem beyond new scientists, this is what I need basically to see, is that when I look at the Big Bang assumptions, well, this guy here, so this is the expansion factor, it's a power law, blah, 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 goes like one over eta squared, this blows up at the Big Bang. So you always start outside the horizon, and then you go inside the horizon. So this precludes an explanation of the fluctuations. Now I'm not saying this, is, this assumes classicality. I, I think quantum gravity people have been incredibly unambitious. There's no reason why quantum gravity couldn't just pop out the universe, just spit out the universe out of a quantum phase with the fluctuations and everything in it. But no one has been able to do this. So basically, as a cosmologist, what you try to do is solve this problem first and then use a physical mechanism for generating the fluctuations. So this is what inflation does, okay? You basically have accelerated expansion and the graduate course conformal time is negative and grows to zero. So this thing actually starts small and grows to infinite, which means you reverse the order. The mode starts inside the horizon and you leave the horizon. Furthermore, in inflation is super cool. So what actually you do is you can look at vacuum fluctuations. That's where we all come from, okay? That's the solution in inflation. What I want to show is what happens if I now have a theory in which somehow this is just the usual assumption in the Big Bang, but I increase the speed of light. And I will tell you how this can be done. So the idea is let this guy blow up, make sure this guy blows up faster. So in other words, I'm looking at, go to that new sign picture, those light cones in the past, open them up. So increase the speed of light in the past, and you basically solve the horizon problem too. So this is one way to do things to solve the horizon problem. In fact, varying C means that C is not constant, okay? <laughs> so it's like saying that an animal is not a dog. It can be a giraffe, it can be an elephant, it can be anything. You can be very conservative and really peace and love, or you can be really nasty. So the original things I did with Andy Albrecht were then called the Mike Tyson version of <laughs> physics because it was really like break everything. Since you're going to break one thing, break everything. So break time translation invariance, break Lorentz invariance, break the principle of relativity. You don't need to do that, 
Okay, you can have a varying C in a very conservative way, actually. And here's one example. So I'm going to focus on these particular theories, biometric theories. Why do I like them more? It's not because I hate Mike Tyson or I don't like to play this game. It's because you can predict the fluctuations in the universe much more accurately, more carefully. So biometric theories are really quite conservative. If you think varying C is a crazy idea, in fact, you've seen something very similar already. You've seen a varying G, okay? So biometric theories are really theories in which you have, to, you like Lorentz invariant so much, you make two copies of it, okay? And you generate two metrics, one for matter, the matter frame, and one for gravity, the Einstein frame. And then you build your einstein hilbert action or your gravitational action with this metric, and you minimally couple the matter to the, this other metric. So two frames, two metrics. Where you've seen this, there's no varying C, there's a varying G, because you make the two metrics conformal, okay? And this happens with dilaton fields and all kinds of things. A varying speed of light theory at this very, very basic level is a theory in which the two metrics are this formal. So effectively, you have, a varying, you have a speed of light which is different from the speed of gravity. And all the massless particles have a light cone which doesn't coincide with the light cone of gravity. So very simple. Of course, in Brand's Dickey theories, the two cones are the same. Here, they're not the same. That's the only difference. Okay, what kind of theories can I come up with uh, in this framework? Um, you really don't have much choice. I don't want to get into the details unless someone asks specifically. But once I have this idea of minimal coupling to matter, and I don't want to go beyond usual Einstein gravity here, the only thing which is new is the, this field phi. What is the dynamics of the field phi? And that really is quite simple. So if you ask the questions, I'll go through this. But effectively, because of some property of gradients, the only thing you need for a minimal theory is just this. So you just need to have a cosmological constant in the matter frame balanced by a cosmological constant in the Einstein frame. Which incidentally, for people who know about these things, if you go to the Einstein frame, this is just a DBI action with the opposite sign. So this is something that comes directly, I'm not going to go into the details, but I'll mention a bit briefly here. Curiously enough, you get the Klein-Gordon equation in the, mat in the matter frame with the cosmological constant in the matter frame. It's not obvious, but that's what you do. And this thing about DBI comes from the properties of the determinant. So you don't really have many, the degrees of freedom are really just this B. So I mentioned these two metrics are related this formally. There's a B here, which could be a constant, or could be a function. And it's really the only free thing I have in the theory. Because this thing determines everything, determines, determines this function here, becomes just minus b. And even the potential, you can show that the Bianchi identities actually fix the potential completely. So not much freedom, OK? Um, but I will reduce the freedom even further in a minute, OK? What kind of fluctuations do I get? Well, I go through the calculations. Typically, I do the calculations in the Einstein frame because it's easier. I go through the whole thing. I have a varying C there, clearly. In fact, it looks like I have a kind of DBI action, which means varying C, effectively. It's DBI does change the varying C. This is the, the kind of fluctuations I get. So this is the result of like the whole calculation. And now you can see something interesting here, OK? So if I have inflation, this is a constant. If I have exactly the Sitter inflation, this is a constant. So this is scale invariant. Now, the reason why I get the red spectrum with inflation is because I must be near the end of inflation to generate the scales I see today. Inflation is so effective in producing things which are big from small. If I'm not careful, the things are too big. So I, I must be near the end of inflation to generate things not too big. So big enough to be me, or to be this, the universe, but not big enough to be bigger than the universe. And that's the reason why the spectrum is slightly red in inflation. It could be all kinds of things. So here you can see what happens. If CS is proportional to rho, this is still true, right? I get scaling variance. So for many, many years, we couldn't actually use this paradigm or whatever. I don't like to call it paradigm, but this idea of varying C to generate anything even close to scaling variance. I, I got N equals 4, I don't know, many times in my life. It's terrible. But you can actually see that from this very simple argument that this actually does generate an S equals 1. And then you go through the whole thing. And in fact, the minimal model, the model with b equals constant, gives you this. So very surprising if I just take the very minimal model, but with b equals constant, so the only thing which is free, 
I basically end up with this conclusion that I have scaling invariant fluctuations, and then you must ask, well, actually, I have red fluctuations. What happens? Why are they red? Um, well, then you play the same game as inflation, which is very sad. Instead of having a potential of a B, you go for the whole thing. And you can generate any NS you want. Very disappointing. So let me make an ad for the reason why you're so excited about this, okay? So at some point, I never liked the idea of vacuum fluctuations. In inflation, you have vacuum fluctuations because you inflate. So you get rid of all the radiation. The only thing left is the vacuum. What else are you going to have but vacuum fluctuations? Here we don't. You're just making the speed of light go, go higher and higher. It's all this radiation that you have around. So thermal fluctuations will be much more reasonable in this scenario. And why not just make all the structure of the universe with thermal fluctuations? So the calculation is quite interesting. Everything I showed you before actually has this factor in the end. You're computing vacuum fluctuations. You end up with something like this, which gives you one half. Whereas if you put the thermal thing there, you end up with the thermal occupation number. Instead, for the modes you're looking at, what happens? Well, this thing is the Rayleigh genes limit. So you end up with a T over K. So typically, when you go from thermal, from vacuum to thermal, you decrease the spectral index by one. By the way, N equals zero is white noise, which is why you say thermal fluctuations are white noise. It's a situation in which you get scale invariant, you get white noise for thermal. Okay, you play the game, and what happens? You go through the calculation. What would generate something scale invariant? And actually, the answer is quite funny. You need a very fast phase transition in C. You don't want C to be proportional to rho. You want C to be just dropped abruptly at some point. And that gives you something which is near scale invariant. And you should get the, the faster the phase transition, the closer you get to NS equals 1. This was discovered a few years back. Until about last year, and this was the state of the affairs, one thing I didn't mention here is, well, OK, what happens to the potential? So we started looking at why is it that exact scale invariance is unreachable. And we started looking at this basically to get some kind of infinite variation in this like, slow roll parameter, which is fast roll in this case in the speed. For this to go to minus infinity, you want this potential to be quadratic. So by the way, as I said, there's a constraint here between the B and the V. If the B is a constant, the V is just a quadratic potential, OK? But what you're asking now is for this guy to go to a quadratic function. And you can see what happens. There's a blip. So in the space of all the possible theories, something happens. This thing, which is always a power law, stops being a power law when B tries to go to F square. When B tries to go to F square, this thing is like a logarithm square. So there is something unique in the space of the solutions. We call this the critical solution, which is everything else is power law, and everything else gives you constant NS. And you can tune things as much as inflation to get the results you want. And this is all very disappointing until you realize there is actually a special solution here, which is this critical solution. Which is very it has actually a, a geometrical interpretation, which we could discuss here, which has you, this quadratic guy here, and this guy is a logarithm. Now, something really strange happens now, and this is the, really what I want to say to finish. What actually happens is that this critical model does not have a power law potential, and this means the speed of sound does not vary as a power law in the density. And this basically means that all you have is a running tilt. You effectively, the, you start with something which is white noise, and it goes all the way to scale invariant. And you have this overarching thing. And what is unique about this theory is that because you don't have reheating, you don't have free parameters like you do in inflation, if you tell me the amplitude of the fluctuations, 10 to the minus 5, I know where I am in this overarching structure. So from the moment in which I know the fluctuations I see in the sky are 10 to the minus 5, I can get this number, okay? And this number kind of matches reasonably well the, the observations. So clearly, by the way, this means, people sometimes are confused by this, this means it's uncertainty in these two numbers here, this in these two here. So this is consistent with that, but improvements would, in principle, do rule out the theory or prove it. So anyway, I really don't have much more to say. This was a different take on things, which was based on a very concrete problem. The problem, to my mind, is that you have an issue of falsifiability with inflation. There were a couple of things said today which I found interesting, because they, in a way they tried to address that. Um, here, I propose an example of a model in which the prediction is very, very well fixed there. So there's no gravity waves, by the way, because I haven't solved the horizon problem for gravity. So there's no production of gravity waves, and the NS is very well fixed. 
And I think you should get, and this kind of theory by nature should get brownie points. If you actually look at predictivity and falsifiability as a hallmark of science, not just evidence in the Bayesian sense, which I predicted before, which is very nice and good for selecting models, but not for evaluating paradigms. So this was conclusions, okay, this is effectively what I did, was slightly, diff having insulted fine tuning initially, which is the topic of this, uh, this, this, this uh, conference. I think what I showed is that there is actually different types of fine tuning and it can be useful, right? So fine tuning traditionally has selected somewhat metaphysical issues. Metaphysical for this kind of audience normally means dirty, means a swear word or something. So this is, uh, for, for scientists anyway, that's what it means. I think it was good that actually a lot of science was in fact motivated and inspired by these problems. I'm not sure they are real problems. So the flatness problem, I'm not sure it's a real problem. I think in contrast, there are some very practical matters which have been dismissed as circumstantial. And I think it's about time you reverse these two things because this issue of fine tuning in very practical matters could be absolutely essential in determining whether a theory is falsifiable and predictive or not. So I think this reversal might lead to a revaluation of the value of predictive theories over the falsifiable ones. And I think, to my mind, more than the issue of you know, inspiring new theories, this could be a very interesting take on fine tuning. Stop here. So time for a couple of questions. David. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> I'm actually going to save the quantum field theory to the discussions, maybe. But I wanted to ask you about your model with the, you take the DBI action and you flip the sign of the kinetic term, yeah. basically. So um, are there any concerns about sort of that you get a unitary theory out of that? Because uh, if you have those higher derivative theories, it's not all signs of higher derivative terms that actually gives you a unitary. This is not higher derivative, right? This is, uh, this you had a square root in the, you have a square right, right. root, and if you expand it out, you get higher derivatives. Well, this is this is no, this is non-quadratic kinetic term, but it's not higher derivative. It's in first derivatives. It's first derivatives sitting inside a square root. Yeah, so I have one plus derivatives, and this sits inside a square root. So I'm, I'm no, it's not. I mean, this is important. It's not linear, but it's not it's not higher order. So the theory is not linear in the field, but it's not higher order in derivatives. So you, you're saying you, you can't expand the square root? You can the expand the square root, but the thing only has first derivatives. So you get first derivatives to power n after? No, you get a nonlinear equation, but which is second order, right? Uh, so did, yeah. what was that? You don't just integrate by parts, you just get higher derivatives. I mean, the DBI action is, well, my understanding, it out, it has so my understanding is that this is quite different. So in fact, I could have told the, the, the DDR ones, the deformed dispersion relation theories have higher derivatives. These ones, as far as I can see, no, they don't. Okay, maybe we can. Okay. okay. Uh, would you go back to your last slide? Which one? The one with the conclusions or the one no, with the... the Planck thing. Sorry? Yes, that one. Okay. okay, so I very much agree with what you said there. And in fact, uh, if you show this to anyone outside the cosmology community and he looks at all these data points given by the models, mm -hmm. they would say, gee, the predictions of your theory are all over the place. It's a very bad theory. So you need to increase its predictivity. Um, and this is precisely what we've been trying to do in quantum cosmology. And now I also understand your question of this morning. Now, if you take the models on the, l on the right side of the, of the slide as your landscape. Oh, you've just gone in the wrong direction. I was nodding. I was very happy with you. Now I'm just doing the opposite. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. You want to measure on this spot in order to increase productivity. Because without it, you're, you can't see anything, right? No, I think what I was going to say is that I, I think inflation could be predictive if information from outside cosmology is selected one of these models. For example, Higgs inflation. So suppose particle physics tells us the only viable model because of other things other than cosmology is Higgs inflation. And it's Starobinsky. It's perfect. Okay? Yeah, my point was that 
quantum cosmology provides a measure on these different theories. You, and it also gerrymandering is, is the expression I throw at you immediately. <laughs> and it also selects a very specific. OK, theory. one thing In I fact, think one thing I think I got from your talk is that you, you may, I don't I'm not sure about I agree with you on this, but I think tell me if I'm wrong because I'm trying to be positive to you. But maybe I'm not. <laughs> I think you actually favor this point along these lines. Is this right? Agreed. In agreement. Okay. Can to, uh, let I me can use this. Okay. 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 Yeah, I'm not sure. I have to speak. So I'd like to show a slide, okay. <laughs> which I had after my last slide, but which I didn't show. I can use this if this works. Huh? Okay. Yeah, it's fine. This works. Cool. Let's see. No, it's calling. It's talking. You have to. You have to press the. So this is the prediction <laughs> of the heart of Hawking wave function. <laughs> and it's published three years ago. Okay. okay. So um, in this specific, for this specific moment. So tell me specifically, if, how much of this is, an, is something which informs the measure, how much of this is actually the prediction of the natural measure? So one thing I'd be very sympathetic with is actually using observations to retroactively inform what the measure is, okay? Because we have assumptions, right? So if you tell me that, that's fine, right? So no, I'm expecting an answer. Come on, man. <laughs> well, that. That's this game of conditional probabilities. Eh? Right. And this is what I, yeah, also there, I think I resonate with, with, with your position. That's what I tried to say all the way at the end. If we don't get a strong a priori probability for some value we observe, right. is this fine? Is this a problem? I am not convinced, indeed. I think. I'd rather take what, we, what Stephen and I call a top-down view, which is much more reconstructing right. the past history from our present right. uh, okay. data. And our, our universe need not be the most likely one. That's, that's another way, a more general way of saying it. Uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, speed of light depends on measuring space and time, and therefore you need clocks and rulers. If you have a variable speed of, t of light, something's happening to your clocks and rulers. Yeah, you have clocks, clocks and rulers for gravity and for matter, which are different. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you don't exactly these days go out and, me and use, like, the meter in Paris and, and your clock to measure yeah. the speed of light. But you need some sort of cosmological clock and ruler. You do, don't you? you do. So this this business of frames, the Einstein frame, yes, and the, cosmo and the matter frame is exactly basically two sets of clocks and rulers. Yeah. Is there both a of them, both of them satisfying Lorentz transformations, incidentally, but separately. Yeah. So the question is, what's happening to the physics that's uh, affecting, if you like, the, the some, speed think, of your I clock, the, the rate of your clock, the and issue. the size suppose, of your ruler? Suppose you measure the speed of gravity with respect to the speed of light, and it's not the same. Yeah but you don't have a preferred frame, and you want to be minimalistic, then you just have these two copies, right, of Florian's. Imagine you have two speeds of light for two types of matter. This is what you would do. If you don't want to um, conflict with relativity, you just make two copies, which is what I did. And what this is saying is that the physics is telling you to build separate clocks and meters for one type of matter and the other type of matter. And this is the minimal thing you can do. You are saying that what really matters is uh, the the difference in the speed between uh, the speed of light and the speed of gravitons. The ratio. Yeah. yeah. So do I get exactly the same results uh, if instead of uh, varying the speed of light, I vary the speed of gravitons? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, you could have done the calculation in the other frame. It's just much more complicated. 
So I did all the calculation in the Einstein frame, but you could have had the opposite situation. Yeah, it's just much more complicated. I mean, the result is the same. But the result will be just massive gravity with the um, it would be a very complicated theory of gravity, that's for sure, because this is just Einstein gravity, if you look at it in the right frame. And um, I think it's more complicated than that. It would be just a mess. I don't know. Okay, further questions for Schwal? If not, let's thank him again. Okay. Thank you very much. So before everybody just runs away, let me just take this opportunity to thank some people who've worked very hard to put this on today, uh, primarily Roger Davis and Leanne O'Donnell and Mike Hicks, who can't be here. Uh, I'd also like to thank Rafael Batista for his very hard work in doing this, and primarily Halil Cham Cham, who did all the organization and put everything together for us today.